So, wunderbar. Ähm, als Beweis, ich habe Twitter aufmerksam gelesen, es gab einen Tweet unter dem Hashtag Quality Series bisher, der bat darum, dass die Mittagspause noch ein bisschen länger dauert, weil das Mittagessen länger dauerte. Das war super, weil wir waren auch ehrlicherweise ein bisschen länger unterwegs. Äh, passt also wunderbar, Social Media wird gemonitort, wir achten drauf. Jetzt aber zurück zum Inhaltlichen. Es geht heute Nachmittag weiter mit Case Studies. Wir reden über ganz konkrete Projekte aus Europa. Wir werden uns widmen Norwegen, wir werden nach Dänemark schauen, wir werden nach Italien gucken, wir werden nach Österreich schauen. Und äh, bei all dem gilt wieder, wie gesagt, der Hashtag Quality Series, wenn ihr schon währenddessen äh, twittern wollt und da eure Meinungen oder Kommentare zu kundtun möchtet. Ich überlasse ansonsten gleich unseren Gästen die Bühne und komme danach für Fragen von euch nochmal wieder mit dazu. Als als nächstes geht es um die Serie, die Netflix als erste Dramaserie überhaupt commissioned hat, Lilyhammer. Sie kommt aus Norwegen und auf die Bühne, da freue ich mich sehr, kommen Lasse Halberg und noch einmal Jens Richter. So this is Lasse. And, um, And works. Lasse, at the time when, when we did this together, Lasse, you were running a company called? I was running a company called Metronome in Norway. It was a couple of production companies, Rubicon Television, who was the producer of Lillehammer, and another company called Metronome Spartacus that did the only and still existing daily soap in Scandinavia, uh, where we started with that in 98, and I think they're turning 20 years so. Um, so uh, we were doing all kinds of productions, um, everything from Big Brother to comedy, talk shows to scripted, and uh, we went heavily into scripted with um, uh, three series where Lillehammer was one of them, and um, I think we just start. We start the, with the trailer. Um, with the first season, because it, this, it, this has been in three seasons. And the first season, um, uh, we created a trailer that uh, we hopefully thought that uh, the international market would pick up. Uh, the language in the series is 50% Norwegian and 50% English, but uh, we told them to cut a tro promo together with only English language. So that gives you also a little about the story, the plot. It's the ultimate fish out of water, so can we just run it? Yeah, that was the promo, the trailer for the first series that we went to the market with, and um, the rest is history. It feels like that was starting in Estonia, and um, the first series Netflix committed to. The plot actually started uh, because the, it's, the series is written by a married couple uh, who were regularly employed at the company Rubicon, and they were big fans of Sopranos. Sopranos was a high-end, very popular about, uh, uh, amongst the, uh, the little upgrade audience in Scandinavia as well in, as in Europe. The, it was never a big uh, rating success, Sopranos, in Europe, uh, especially never in the, in the Sopranos countries like Italy and so. And I don't think it was a big success in rating-wise in Germany either. Anyway, they were big fan of Sopranos, and I was too, and they were going with that idea of how, what about if we combine uh, the most innocent city in Norway, <coughs> which was the former Olympic city of Lillehammer, 1994, together with um, a street smart mafia guy from New York. Uh, the character were more or less taken from uh, the character Stephen played in Sopranos, Silvio Dante, who was kind of the comic relief in Sopranos, if it was a comic relief there but uh, he was running the strip club Bada Bing. Uh, we never had Steven attached at the moment, but we used him, we used a, a picture from him from the Sopranos area to sell it. And we got a development deal in 2009 with the, the public broadcaster NRK. And we never thought about making a series uh, going abroad. We were doing this for a local station. The language will be 50% English because Steven only speak English or the American actor we're going to hire for it. And the rest will be Norwegian. 
Uh, why, how could we do that? Yeah, because in Norway and in Scandinavia in general, everybody speaks English. So Americans or English people who move there, uh, they can be living there for 20 years, they never learn to speak the, the, the Norwegian language, but they understand the Norwegian language. So we had this guy actually learning Norwegian on his, uh, on a, on his headset. Uh, so he, he always replied in English and they kept on speaking Norwegian. If the Norwegians was together, they speak Norwegian, of course, to each other. Anyway, they came up with the idea, idea if we combine this very mafia street smart guy from New York with his innocent cities with rednecks and hillbillies and uh, make a drama out of it. Well, a, dr a drama series with comedy relief in it. And um, the public broadcaster turned on it and uh, we started to... to um, Create the series and uh, believed in it. We were struggling a lot with um, the financing, of course, because uh, the public broadcaster couldn't afford to pay that much. But actually, the first budget was mainly based on Norwegian money, and uh, I needed some small pieces, which Jens later helped me, <laughs> so we could do it. Um, so then was the series. So when when Lassie called me, when Lassie called me, um, I was sitting in the office. It's afternoon. The phone goes. Lassie calls me. He says, uh, "I'm working on this drama show." I said, "Cool." And then he says, uh, "Do you want to distribute it and put some money into it?" And my first reaction was, "No way! <laughs> totally stupid idea." Because you do not put money into Norwegian drama, okay? So, um, you don't do it. And um, so then, then he gave me the pitch. And, um, and at that time, I think it was one or two pages of paper. It wasn't more. There wasn't a script. Um, and as Lasse said, the, the, the hook here really is, um, it's a very original hook. The hook is, um, if there could have been ever a spin-off of Sopranos, it would be Lily Hammer. And, um, and to do that with Stephen Fenzant, by the time you called me, you had Stevie already signed. Um, so it was spin of Sopranos, Stevie Fenzant, um, and after that sank down, um, we said yes. And yeah. we put the money. You weren't easy to convince, but um, I think it was a good decision for, at the time you were named 7-1 International, now it's Red Arrow. Um, actually, uh, we were owned at the time by Shine, uh, which was Liz Murdoch and uh, her company. Our sister companies was Kudos, uh, who make uh, Broadchurch, by the way. Uh, Filmlands in Sweden, who has done the Bridge and Beck series, which is pretty known in Germany, I think. Uh, I pitched the idea for Liz a couple of times. They loved the idea. And from, for the Kudos people and from the people from uh, uh, China America, which was the former Revelier who started the office on Aglibet in LA. Everybody loved the idea, but nobody came up with the money. <laughs> and that's the time. Um, first, we, did, had, uh, we hadn't signed Stephen at the time, but uh, we were able to, to sign Stephen in the summer 2009. In a way, we couldn't clear the, the production. And actually, the meeting we had was that he was playing with Bruce Springsteen in Bergen. So uh, the married couple flew over there. They had a newborn kid, three weeks old. And they were able to get 20 minutes with Stephen before they go on stage with Bruce. And after two and a half hours, the roadie came in and said, Stevie, you need to be on the stage. And he was sold. They later went uh, over to New York to talk about the series with him. And he loved it. And I went over in December, uh, flew over, took a meeting two hours and flew back and he was signed. And then we had Stephen. And even though we had Stephen sign on, we couldn't get any money from the Shine system. Or, 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 but they loved the idea. They loved the idea by doing remakes of it. But we didn't care about remakes. We needed to get this, this off uh, air uh, and start the production. And then I called Jens, and luckily I had him as a friend, and he, <laughs> he heard a crazy idea. Um, 
so we were able to, to get it on. But it was far away from being sold internationally. And we were still producing a local Norwegian series. Um, and we started the production. And uh, we started production in January. And we were about to show it uh, uh, with Red Arrow, a uh, trailer, uh, the following MIP in April in Cannes. So I told the people that, uh, can you make a very international, complete English-speaking trailer, maximum two and a half minutes, take the best scenes we have, what we have shot so far. And um, I remember when that trailer was shown at the stand in Cannes, and everybody seen it, came out, and they just said, hooray, it was Come, the best comes, comes to the point we had early in the morning, it's like marketing. Um, so what we did there was basically, the show is how much English language dialogue? The first season? 50% max. 50%. So 50% English language dialogue and 50% Norwegian. 50% English is not enough normally to sell into an Anglo-Saxon, in, into an English-speaking market. So on purpose, what you saw on the promo, it's like a lot of the English scenes. You don't hear them talk in Norwegian. Um, and um, I must say, even myself, when I saw the first time, the first episode, full episode, I was like, oops. Um, that's going to be interesting. Um, the, the feedback on the show was absolutely hilarious, fantastic. When, when, we, when we went to MIP, we had Stevie there. And, and Stevie Fensand, when you see him here, and, or when you know him from Sopranos, he's not really an actor. That's the guy. You know, that's the guy you have. That's the guy you go to market with. That's the guy you take into a pitch meeting with a broadcaster. That's him. It, it's exactly him. Um, unbelievable, but, but very true. So um, taking him to Cannes was an absolute blast. Um, and um, we got a lot of attention right out of the gate. Um, and the idea of financing the show was, if it goes kind of OK, um, we can sell this to public broadcaster here and there in Europe and make our money back. Um, from the perspective of the distributor. If it goes wrong, well, it goes wrong. Um, and if it goes really, 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 really right, um, then we have to try to get into English language territories, which would also be the US, but not necessarily only the US. We also thought about the UK and Australia, of course. Yeah, Stephen became a, a partner on the, on the script also because we also wanted him to, because he's not an actor, so he really has to be that character. And uh, one of the big things, we didn't want to do a procedure of, of a soprano, so we wanted to tweak him a little away from that, even if he know uh, that there will never be a follow-up on Sopranos, so this is his chance. Uh, so he always wanted it to go a little more Sopranos. We wanted the comedy as well as the public broadcaster in Norway. But he believed so much in the series, and he kept on saying from day one that, let's say, we're going to sell this to U.S. He yeah, can't keep on dreaming, I said, that the U.S. has never bought a, a series that uh, has to be subtitled. They will never do that. That will never happen. So keep on dreaming. But... I love your loyalty, I love your spirit that uh, uh, you think we can do that. And um, let's hope for it. But he was really, um, it was burning for the series, so he really uh, loved it. And at the time uh, after it was actually sold to the US, uh, at the market in MIPCOM in the following fall, in October, he was there at the stand and he was a hardworking guy. He had, um, every half hour meeting from nine o'clock in the morning to when it closed down. And he was really <laughs> going around and selling it. And so he's tremendous in that way. But, uh, but what you see is Steven uh, in, in the character. So he's more like that street smart New York guy. He's not in the mafia, by the way. <laughs> That's what you say. Um, I'm not convinced. Um, <laughs> The, the, the thing really was, um, I mean, what, what, what made it very special, of course, was um, getting it into, into Netflix. And um, it was a kind of a, uh, well, Deutschland 83 situation. It was, the show was in production. The show was financed. 
Um, it was clear where the show goes uh, in terms of production and by the, uh, when it's finished. Um, and then the idea came out um, to have the first, how many scenes were those? Four? First scenes were also, the trailer was edited, the first scenes were edited. Yeah, it was like that. It wasn't more than two, two three minutes we had to show them. Actually, the, the series was produced. It was shot when, when Netflix saw it first time. We shot it from January to June. Uh, we could have needed some more money to make it a little better, but um, the following summer after it's shot, um, we go to Netflix. And um, Netflix, what we know at that time is that Netflix has committed for a bunch of dollars uh, their first original series, which was House of Cards. House of Cards. Uh, so they have already commissioned House of Cards. And they have never done any original. So Ted Sarandos actually gets the series and and um, he goes to Reed Hastings, who is the CEO of the Netflix, and said, I, I know how we're going to launch our original series. And Reed said, yes, let's hear. Yeah, we have this 50-50 English, Norwegian, and he tells the story. And Ted Reed is looking to Ted and say, are you fucking nuts? But you're probably right. So that was Ted's stomach feeling that, uh, because they have a very, at that time, they might have changed now, but they, they know the viewers, so they, they could post out to all those people who loved Fargo, the feature film. And this was kind of in, a, in a way in the same area, even if it was more comedy. And he understood the, the fact that there will not be another Sopranos or a follow-up on Sopranos. So, and we had Steven. And it helped that Ted Sarandos He's the biggest fan of Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. So <laughs> that helped also. And for them it was like, um, when you look at um, Sopranos, you said earlier, it wasn't really successful in Europe, which is absolutely right. It was, I think, ZDF on the Sunday night and it didn't go anywhere really. Um, Sopranos in America was a monster success for HBO. It was one of those few series that made HBO HBO. And Netflix at that time, they didn't say it, they say it openly now, uh, but at that time they had in their mind, we want to be in that spot, we want to be HBO. So it's like the Sopranos thing and being the fan of E Street Band, that, that all really came together um, in the most beautiful way. And, and Stevie was in the room um, with Ted and um, that makes, by the way, a huge difference anyhow. I mean also in your future life. If you have a talent of that caliber, bring the guy into the room. Makes all the difference. And even if you, I, I have that all the time, even with broadcasters who say they've seen everybody, once they see somebody, they react differently. Um, and um, so, and then the, the, the feedback was, okay, there is a deal. So they wanted to, they wanted to close on Lilyhammer um, in a situation where Lilyhammer was, as you say, it was shot. It wasn't cut and edited yet, but it was shot. Um, and then, um, where's the nice lady who's going to ask me about the financial terms? You. <laughs> have to be careful, right? Um, and uh, the fun situation happened. Um, the show was financed. We didn't need the money. Um, we had a client who wanted to buy the show. We didn't need the money. So you can go crazy in that situation as a seller because if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. You don't need the money because the show is produced, right? Um, and um, and it, 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 I can't say the deal terms, but it, it came to a point where, can you say the, the Norwegian budget of season one? The Norwegian budget of season one was approximately $500,000 at the time. Yeah. It's uh, awesome, huh? Um, so $500,000, and, and, and I, I think what we can say is they paid us more than the budget. And uh, the fun thing is that they didn't buy one series, they bought two series before we had 
the public broadcasters buying the second series. And at that time when you sold to Netflix, you only sold them the America. So they didn't get like when you go there now with an original, they, they only got North and, and, and South America. That was it. So I still believe um, Stevie must be mafia. In a way, in a way, we had a, we had a session in Oslo once where we were about to kill a producer. Where he said that he's going to back me all the way to the high court. And I was just looking at him. And it was like, shit, I'm Tony Sopranos and you are the guy from Bada Bing. Um, so, in a way. Uh, no, the fun thing is that Netflix actually jumped on it. They, they bought two, they committed to two series immediately. And we produced eight episodes and they say we want two series between eight and 13 episodes at the time. And we know we will never be able to, to write more than eight episodes a year. Also, public broadcasting in Norway, they make a successful series and uh, it's not sure they're gonna do a follow-up, the second series, which is pretty hopeless when you work in the international market. So actually, after we start shooting the second series, I actually signed the agreement with the public broadcasting in Norway for the second series. So uh, at that time, Netflix became the savior of the series. And um, yeah, the rest is. So what happened was, um, so the first season produced at a controlled budget of 500,000. Um, I remember we had the Netflix deal closed. The series was still in post-production. So yeah. some of the money that came in was put into the music. Yeah, we needed to do something with the music because we, in, in, uh, in a $500,000 production, you don't have that kind of uh, music budget you need for international and music cost. So what we uh, needed to do if it is going international is to clear a lot of music. And Stephen is a musician. So he wanted to have Frank Sinatra, all the kind of commercial music, and I saw that those dollars is going to fly away. Luckily, he's a musician, and he knows all people in the music, music, music business, so we were able to buy out and clear music uh, globally in perpetuity, all territories, uh, with a little help from Stephen who brought down the figures, and we could use all Stephen's own music that he has produced for free, so that helped. But suddenly, the music budget was like 25, 30% of the, of the complete budget we had. We never, but that's how it is in the US. In the US, that's a very small number, but for us, it became essential. So um, without Netflix, that would never happen. No. And then, then we took the show to market. We had these amazing meetings uh, with broadcasters. We sold it to... Um, BBC, um, Rai in Italy, we had FIC, Fox International Channel, channels in, in some of the territories and some of their feeds as a partner. Um, so it worked out really well. Um, what we have to say as well at that time, because it's going to interest you as producers, at that time in 2012 at Netflix, there were like uh, literally two people, um, Cindy Holland and Peter Friedlander together with Ted. So there were two people working with Ted Surrenders running the whole programming side. There were no people. So when you got your show sold, there was nobody to really follow up. You know, it's like, that is one of the reasons why people at the beginning said when you work with Netflix, it's like the creative freedom. Um, I can assure you, when you go into the same building now, where they had like half a floor at that time, um, they're in most of the building now, and they have an army of producers, and um, there are a lot more hands-on now. Um, so we had, we, the first season went out. Um, how season two, one of our, one of our, for season two, first of all, we had Netflix as a co-producer, so that, there would be no yeah, more money on the, the table. The first season went out, and actually we were launching this in uh, uh, October 2011 when Stephen went to, to Cannes, and uh, we were still negotiating the agreement with Jens and his colleagues and uh, Netflix, uh, so we hadn't really signed it yet, but we had agreed. Uh, but Ted Sarandos had a keynote speech at, in, at MIPCON, and 
everybody in the whole business sitting in the in the big auditorium and we were thinking will we be able to announce this during this MIPCON and suddenly he started the whole keynote saying we have just bought our first original series Lillehammer made the paperwork easier <laughs> so um, uh, that was kind of fun but um, uh, we had the freedom, we had all the freedom. They never wrote a script. They never, I, I asked Peter Friedlander, do you want to see a script? Oh, it's not necessary. Uh, we believe you, we trust you. Okay, shit, I never heard about that because I know how the networks in the US is the, with the notes and everything. Uh, but at the time, they, they trusted people doing it, so they didn't care about it. Uh, they believed that they're going to get great stuff. Um, but, of course, things change over the years. And, um, and uh, there has always been, will it be a more American series or will it be the local fish out of water that, that we created? And Stephen also said this in all, all interviews we had, and we said it, why? Because I remember that in Cannes, we, they asked us, why, don't, why do you selling the original series? Because it's Norwegian language. And both Stephen and I said that, well, we had a main character that's impossible to move, and that's Lillehammer, the city. We can't move that, so therefore, that was our answer. And Stephen kept on saying that, we can't move Lillehammer, so we don't do remakes. We also, that was very early on when we had our very, very first call. Basically, what we agreed on was, let's try the original tape. If we can sell that original tape, we're going to freeze the format for at least a couple of years. And after we had the Netflix deal done, and it was clear that they be, become co-producers on season two, then anyway, you, 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 you lock the format away because it makes life for the original really, really, really hard. There is like in our industry, a lot of examples where it didn't work out well, having the original and the remake out. Um, and um, moving Lilyhammer, the, the, the most interesting format feedback we got was um, from well, there's only one, as you can imagine, um, from a Swiss broadcaster. So uh, a Swiss German broadcaster wanted to do a remake of Lillehammer, you know. Um, English broadcasters came, wanted to do a remake of Lillehammer. German German broadcasters came um, to do... Uh, we, we, we actually had a lot of demand for, for the format. And the format is until today um, frozen. It could be defrozen, but now we're not there anymore. Could be defrozen now, but uh, I can tell you, I had the whole shine, and later on News Corp asking about the remake and say that we don't do remakes of this. Uh, that is something we are committed to. So they were kind of frustrated that they weren't able to do remakes, but we said no to that. And, and uh, because we wanted, and it became a success, the first series was sold to about 180, 190 territories. I don't know if it's that many countries, but it's about 170. It's about what you can sell. When, that's every, when about, anybody that's tells you world. more than 180, it's then the they start world. to lie, okay, so. And uh, it became when Netflix was about to launch in Scandinavia, which was the, the uh, third place actually after UK. They, they were about to launch. Uh, Ted and Reed flew into Oslo and uh, Stockholm and Helsinki and Copenhagen. And uh, they used, especially in Norway, but also in, in Sweden, they used uh, Lillehammer to launch their, their um, services in Scandinavia. And by that time, it had been on uh, air on NRK with an audience of 1.1 million viewers. In the country is 5 million, so it was about 70% market share. And in Sweden, it had... Uh, higher ratings than, um, than uh, their biggest drama series too. So that was the first Norwegian series that was a success in Sweden. And it did and help that the Norwegian Prime Minister on his Facebook side... Yeah, Jens Toltenberg, who is now General Secretary at NATO, he was tweeting <laughs> about half an hour before the series every Sunday and said, now we need to see how, what happens with Frank, <laughs> Frankie. <laughs> So Jens was tweet tweeting all the time about the series, and he loved it. Uh, and uh, it became a huge success. Uh, and we were also, how will the Norwegians, because, and especially the people in Lillehammer, because we handled them like 
they are rednecks, but in Lillehammer, the word stopped when the series was on air. So uh, they really love it. And I have a cabin up there and going skiing and sitting in the ski lift uh, during the winter time and hearing all the people talking about it. They don't know who I am. That was just astonished how, how, they, how they really took the whole series to their heart, even if we are making kind of a fool of the, the people from Lillehammer. Anyway. How, tell us a little bit, how did season two evolve? So season one was made for a local audience at a local budget. For season two, you had Netflix as a co-producer. We had in the season one 50% English, 50% Norwegian. Um, did that language mix stay? What, what changed? First of all, this was a drama day. This comedy with, with some drama aspects and uh, it, it was supposed to, people were supposed to laugh at the series. Uh, it's the ultimate fish out of water. You can't go far, far, more far away from each other doing that. And we never thought about making a second series, even if we hoped we could do it in a way. But we have told the whole story about how this guy who goes under witness protection end up in Lillehammer and he fell in love and uh, his girlfriend got pregnant. They got twins. Uh, so we had a cliff there. They could have the twins in the beginning of the second series and they can divorce and blah, blah, blah. Uh, but we always had that fight that uh, some people wanted to tweak it more to Sopranos, more in the mafia world, because he really creates mafia world in, in Lillehammer. He creates a new business in Lillehammer, which is completely based on criminal aspects. And so Lillehammer turns to be something else. And evolving that to the second series, uh, the story was told, how do we do that now? So the second series actually has two big themes. One is, uh, uh, one, is uh, one of the guys buying a, a Ferrari who he crashed, and that Ferrari is actually happened to ha end up in, in Lillehammer because it's, uh, it's um, a recession in, in UK, so it's a, a hooligan in Millwall in UK and a, a British mafia who think that in Norway they're so rich they can sell the, I can sell the car there. What happens is that the car, the guy, the redneck, he smashes into a, a moose, so the car is destroyed. Um, so we had some great British actors, the hooligans coming over, but that only lasts for about four, five episodes. So, and then we had this great ending that Stevie came up with that uh, James Gandolfini is gonna play in the last episode, which he said yes to and also there were the woman who plays the wife in Sopranos, but then Jim Gandolfino died, so we need to rewrite that last episode. But at the second series, it more turned out to, you lost in the way, you lost the DNA of the series, um, and it was more created to suit the international market instead of how this series came uh, together in the beginning. Uh, with keeping the Norwegian focus, making fun, fun situation, which even the Americans laughed a lot about uh, when they saw the series. I was in the same room and Bruce Springsteen saw the first episode and he was laughing a lot and he doesn't watch that much television. Harvey Weinstein was there in the room. He also laughed a lot in the first episode. So, but the second series, we're already starting to lose the DNA of the series, what is this about? This is still the fish out of water guy. He's still there and he's trying to change uh, this innocent city, this innocent country into a mafia thing. And we started to travel. Uh, we have the last two episodes in series two. We are ending up in New York. Cost a fortune to shoot uh, there. It helped to spend the money, which was good. <laughs> um, the the um, side effect was for us, as Lasse say, says, um, the British hooligans coming over to Lillehammer and then the last episode over in America brought the English language dialogue um, component up quite a bit because what we realized was um, that 50-50 really didn't work. It's a learning forever. You know, it's like 50-50 if you want to end up in English language 
then rather stay completely German. Um, <laughs> but if you want to attract an original American audience, you have to get more to the 70 or 80 percent if you want to end up there. Um, so for international, it was a good side effect. The budget went up to what level? Uh, the budget was probably, well, the budget, ending of the first series, adding the music with the international rights, brought the budget up a little, uh, a lot. Uh, but uh, the second series uh, more or less doubled the budget. And I don't want to, in the third series, they end up in the US network drama. And so, but it didn't become better, and the ratings didn't go up. And Netflix, they never reveal figures when we started, uh, but they launched the show in 1st of February, 5th of February, 2012, and I know that by August, which I was told, uh, the series had had two million households had watched all episodes, and two million households in US is, uh, is a huge rating if you go to cable network. If you have cable a, with two million households, you get renewed, for sure. Yeah, At, as of yeah. 1.5 these days, you are like in a good spot. Yeah. So, um, the series evolved, and uh, maybe we should uh, turn into there's this. Another, there's another trailer. Third? If that is of, which season is this one now? That, this is for the third series. Before you put that on, hold on a second, please. Could you tell us a little bit about where the creative went for the third season? The creative went more to Sopranos. Uh, I left the series actually after the second series and I was uh, the, the one who was keeping Stevie. He, he really listened to me and I said that we need to keep that uh, if we're going to be original and special. If you turn that to just another Sopranos, that won't help us for the international market. Might help you a little on Netflix, but we will lose the DNA and the series will not become any special anymore. So we will just be blurring out the whole thing. And uh, so we had our fights, but he always listened in the end. Uh, but he always wanted to take it f further far away. And uh, um, he got some more influence, but it also became more influenced from all kinds of people around it. Netflix probably, NRK, the public broadcaster there in Norway. And it then, you could see it, uh, it became more and more compromising with the series, what it is about. There was too much fight for money and there was too much fight for, because the show made money. Oh yeah. Um, and there was too much fight for money and there was too much fight for, for influence on the creative side. There wasn't the one single creative vision that was shared by everybody. No. I think that that's really, for me, that was like the learning clearly. If you want to set up something for multi-seasonal, be clear about your vision early on. Don't get distracted. And even if money comes into your way, don't get distracted by the money um, because then you move the show into the wrong yeah, you spend a lot of money on, on things that actually it doesn't give you any uh, extra on, on the, the finished product uh, on screen. Uh, you spend a lot of money by traveling, shooting in weird uh, locations like in Rio in Brazil and all over the world. Uh, Interesting uh, to say is like yeah. during like by the third season, um, Netflix was already in half of the world. So the first season went for the Americas. By season three, we had to give them a lot more territories in order for them to make it interesting um, and for, for them to give us more money. Um, so I, I was, we were, as a sales organization, we were in this very bizarre situation where we had to call the BBC, for instance, and say, ah, you know, the series that you, showed, that you bought like a year ago, have you aired it? No, we haven't aired it yet. You know, it, it's not that good. Um, it probably won't work. Um, and we really talk them out of their own show um, to give it back to us um, and to make the way open to Netflix um, so that, uh, because that was very clear for Netflix then, we only move forward if we get da 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 da. So they wanted Germany, they wanted um, the UK, and uh, France. So we had to make these territories which we already had sold available again. Um, 
that was bizarre, um, but it worked out. So let's have a look into that promo. When I first came to Norway, I was struck by all the beauty. Beautiful nature, beautiful people. <laughs> but you Norwegians, you got one flaw. You don't know how to enjoy life. Somebody's gotta teach you guys how to have a good time. Take yourself high, baby. Yeah. Oh, got some real shit going on here. By any chance, be looking for an extra pair of hands. Well, due respect, you're here because of your uncle. You don't like it here. Whatever you say, Frank, it's your house. Someone trying to send us a message. I figured we'd do one to them. And they did one to us. Not for now. It's not a prank. This town ain't big enough for the two of us. It will be justice. I promise you. It will be vengeance. Or 98% sure. <laughs> You, you can imagine that uh, one of the main characters is uh, missing more and more, and that is the city, Lillehammer. Thomas asked me two things. One is to clarify the budget. Um, so when, when Lasse said 500, it's not the whole season. You know, it's like that was per episode. Um, then you put the music on top, and then you get more closer probably to seven, six, seven hundred by the time it was edited and done. Then season two, it was roughly double that. So it went to, you know, like went closer to one and a half, probably. 1.2, 1.3, 1.4, something like that. Um, and some money got lost. And, um, and by the last season, um, by the last season, it was two and a half. So it, also that as a learning, never be involved in a show that like the budget goes, uh, my math, I can't even do that. Um, like four times or whatever up. Um, it's not healthy. It's like to manage that process. Um, Lasse did an amazing job there. Bus Business-wise, the first and the second series was better business than the third season, even if the money went up. Business-wise, the first season was by far the best. Um, sorry to be that blank. blank. Um, a couple of slides quickly. Um, because we are running out of time, I'm going to do this very quickly. Um, I just wanted to show you Brief overview, uh, Netflix at that time and where they are now, um, because we spoke about Netflix earlier today, um, that you get an idea. Could you get that screen up there? Somebody? Hmm? Technique? Somebody here in the room who can help me to get the presentation? Yes, thank you very much. So, um, just a brief like intro, who, now I get the feedback here again. Um, so these guys launched as a, as a DVD postal service. I don't know to what, uh, whether you're aware of that. When you were a Netflix subscriber, you got per week, no, no, it wasn't even per week. You got an envelope with a couple of DVDs sent to your house. And um, as soon as you were through with them, you packed them back into the envelope and sent them on, and then you got the next. So you sent them back, and you got the next envelope. If you a fast DVD, you, know, you got like two a week. Um, that's how they launched. Um, this is a little bit an idea of their business model. So you pay per month. 
Um, and you pay whether you have one, two, or four screens. So we have at home at our house, we have four screens. So we have like, at the same time, we can have four users um, being hooked up. Um, this slide is two weeks old. Netflix just announced they're going to uh, raise by one dollar per month in America um, very soon. So it won't stay this cheap. We should be all aware of that. Um, this is their global footprint at the moment. Um, they are at 69 million subscribers. Um, Red, the US, the Americas, this is where we saw the season one. Um, that's a very good question. Um, they are just making some money since last uh, business year. They're making their slightly break even. Um, when you compare their business model to HBO, HBO is a cash machine, a huge cash machine. These guys don't really make money yet. Um, these guys run at the moment a um, program expenditure of roughly three and a half billion a year. And they forecast that within the next three to four years, their program investment budget annually will be between six to seven billion. They're going to be the number one investor in programming worldwide. Do you know how high they would have to raise subscription? See, that's a tricky part. They, they already start to, to raise in America. Um, when, you, when you look into the American market, when um, in America people have cable subscription. And if you have your cable subscription and you have the big package, you have the HBO and if you have sports and all that kind of stuff, you can, spare, you can spend well beyond $200 a month. Television in America as a consumer is really expensive. So these $10 here is dirt cheap. So there is space for sure. Um, but their main um, race now is going global, gaining a subscriber base. So they need to get like beyond the 100 million rather quickly. Um, this is the evolution of programming. Um, so all on the left-hand side, there is our Lillehammer. That's where it all started. Um, and then from there, they went into, you see, um, first exclusive multi-year licensing deal with Weinstein. They made some deals with bigger studios. They, they acquired the first documentary films. Um, they tried different kind of genres. Horror, Hemlock Grove, Orange is the New Black, you guys know probably as well. Um, a very successful launch for them was uh, Daredevil. I think it's for them so far the most successful launch. Um, Marco Polo, um, you know as well. Um, and then the first local stuff comes in. Um, so you have the first Spanish original, um, you have the first uh, this week on Netflix, their first theatrical original launched. Um, um, Marseille is in production. Um, some of you might have seen Narcos. Um, pretty cool as well. So what they do is you have a mix of languages. They go now beyond um, everything highly serialized um, and um, everything pretty much out of the box. Um, this is their split in programming. So you have um, from all their original programming. Original programming is the stuff they commission and they label original. We said earlier, I mentioned at some point, we sold them the return. They labeled it as an original, but in fact, that was more like a licensing product. Return would be here as well in here, in the blue. So f three quarters of their stuff is, is drama. Very, very heavy focus on drama. When you compare this to, for instance, Amazon, Amazon, the, the program mix looks completely different. Lilyhammer and the other stuff. Um, lots of comedy they are now trying. Documentary, first they acquired, now they commissioned. And then we finished. Feature films, and uh, the interesting is the last point here. Um, they just announced that they're going to have a Chelsea Handler talk show. And that's going to be the first show that Netflix actually is producing in-house. So these guys also want to become a studio. So when they tell you they're the whatever, of the, 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 the heaven of all the producers, you know, at the end of the day, uh, they, they also want to be a studio themselves. They want to be producers themselves. Um, thank you much. Okay, there was a lot of information, and um, I would 
make my part extremely short. I would just ask if there are any questions in the audience besides the budget. I think we clarified the budget because I, I just uh, read about the budget for season three, which was $17 million for the whole season three of Lilyhammer. So that was because there was some whispering around me, wow, 500,000 for the first and then 17 million for the third. But, but we clarified that. It's uh, per episode. It was per episode. Good. Are there any further questions from the audience? Yes, there is a question. Do we have a... Perfect. Uh, I have a question about uh, Netflix. And uh, for example, there is this idea of Netflix producing a German a series, whatever. Uh, what do you think? Because Germans tend to watch English TV, American TV, a series. Uh, why would Netflix produce a German series if they watch English ones? Um, because they do that in every market. So when you, when, um, as Lasse said, like Lilyhammer was a launch platform, a launch product for them. Um, Marseille in France as well, um, that is probably a commission more of political reasons. But what they do is um, they try once in a while to do something local to really attract the local subscriber base. I mean, never forget this is subscription service. So they, they need to gain subscribers. Um, and we spoke earlier in the morning the power of drama to gain subscribers. This is their, their game. When you look at what kind of local stuff they actually commission, they never commission the local, local stuff. They always commission something, you know, like Marseille, which, yes, it's local, but that's a genre, gangster, mafia, whatever, that will travel. When you look at Narcos, you know, this is like uh, connects North and, and Latin America. So they would, they would probably commission something out of Germany, which has international relevance. And um, funny enough, then after Deutschland and all the success and da-da-da-da-da, now they tell you, Deutschland 83, that's what we would like to commission. If you're going to be on the local market, you need to, to have a stamp down there. And in Scandinavia, in Norway, they became the major uh, subscription service immediately and, and uh, was the market leader on it. So they need to do that, uh, but they won't spend tons of series in each of the territory. But it's a subscription service, which means that a lot of people are leaving it in January. Uh, you keep it for kids, so it's like old pay TV. They refuse to say that they were uh, going to be a new HBO. First time they said it officially was this last summer, when they say that they're going to be a HBO. And they are forced into spend a lot of money in production, but they're not going to do 10 German series, but they need to have a footprint here yeah. to become German. We have one last question. Thank you. In the rear. Uh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so I have the question about um, the actor being attached to help you pitch the show. I'm here. Hello. Um, so you said first you went to the Norwegian local um, studio to, to, to produce it, and um, it was a Norwegian project first. Uh, then you told the idea to, uh, to the actor, got him attached, and used that to help pitch it further. So what was the stage you were when you pitched it first without the actor, and how, how did that change? Like, I mean, how, and how did you get the actor um, to sign on it without having the f financing um, being all clear? Yeah, we got that meeting before he went on stage with Bruce in Bergen, and he, he loved it, what he read. And the married couple who wrote the series, they went to New York, and they were discussing it, and he loved the series. And he know that it's not going to be any Sopranos. This is his chance, maybe, to do something in the same. He's not an actor. And then the, the, uh, the getting the actor into the room for the pitch, when you work with American talent or with English talent, it's actually really, really easy because they used to do that all the time. It makes the big difference. So you get them into the room with a Netflix or you get them to uh, a MIPCOM and get them into the room with the buyers. Um, it's more unusual with German talent. For Americans, it's normal stuff. Well, then I would say uh, we are closing the session on Lilyhammer. Thank you very much for your information. Oh, we have one more question. I'm sorry. Question here in the second row. No, just a second, and we have it on. 
Um, for me, it's again from the author's point of view. So this couple sold their idea and had written all the series already for the first season. Or did they just sell the idea and then collaborate it? They were regularly employed by the company I was working, that was I was running. And we, did, we entered into a development deal with the public broadcaster NRK, which is probably ZDF or whatever it is, mm -hmm. uh, in Germany. So uh, uh, we went into pre-project development, and uh, uh, we came up with one script, the pilot script, and they loved it. And so they said, OK, to the series. Then we may, went to the foundation, film, um, uh, TV Foundation in Norway. We didn't get any money in the first run from there. So we needed to start funding money elsewhere. But, uh, and then we started to produce scripts when we greenlighted the series. And they did all three They seasons. were writing the series as we were shooting it, actually. Oh, wow. Like in an yeah. American way. Yeah. Uh, we, had to, we, we hired three other people who came from the Lilla, the film school in Norway is also in Lillehammer. So we hired three other people who, who was in this kind of write this room light. <laughs> Very good. Talked about. So we were written the series while we were shooting. Okay. Amazing. Perfect. Then thank you very much for your thoughts and opinions. And uh, give a round of applause for Jens and Lasse. Thank you very much.